Hey everybody, welcome to Solar Punk Life. So Jason and I had the great privilege of being able to talk to Corey Doctorow on Tuesday night. And we did this over the internet, of course, and so the coming video that you're gonna see in just a second, there's a little bit of audio quality issues, specifically on Jason's audio. This is our first time actually with this type of interview and you really don't tell someone like Corey no can we get it perfect first <laughs> and there was a little bit of video quality issues as well because of lag and whatnot so stick with it this is a long video but I think it's well worth it so uh, we recently uh, released a video about the right to repair and tied it into one our creation of a tool library and um, our community member, Jamie, reached out to the EFF to see if someone there wanted to talk, and you gladly donated some of your time to, to talk to us, uh, which is awesome. Um, we, uh, we, we are, as solar pumps, we are very, uh, we're pushing the right to repair right now because uh, we don't like waste. And if we can refurbish and reuse uh, old, I guess, old technology, uh, and and be able to to crack into that. It it really helps us uh, meet our goal of being able to sustain. Uh, so, uh, we like I said, we uh, really appreciate you coming on and and talking to us today. Thank you so much. Absolutely, my pleasure. Uh, happy to talk about this. Uh, Certainly, the intersection of science fiction and tech policy is where I live. So, so uh, before we jump into uh, some of your your recent works, uh, let's talk about the right to repair in the EFF. Uh, Joe has uh, been a big, big, really into the EFF uh, a lot longer than I have. So, Joe, do you want to do you want to take over here? Yeah. So, you know, I'm a I'm a computer scientist, and and uh, I, I go back a ways, and so. But I'm also a big uh, gaming nerd. So, you know, I, as I recall, the story of the founding of the EFF was, of course, when Steve Jackson Games was raided by the Secret Service while they were writing the cyberpunk uh, uh, expansion for the GURPS role-playing game. And, you know, I was, in, I was in, I think, college at the time when that was happening. And so I was, you know, aware of it from both a, a computer perspective, from a, a, a gaming nerd perspective, and uh, whatnot. So I was super excited to, to see that you were with the EFF. And uh, so tell us a little bit about your history with the EFF and then maybe go into, you know, why you're a big champion for the right to repair. Sure. Well, this is uh, going into my 20th year with the Electronic Frontier Fund. My, my, uh, at the end of this year, it will be 20 years. Um, and uh, I started uh, working on issues related to copyright primarily. Uh, it was in the days of P2P. Uh, and the Napster Wars, and I was doing a startup, and that startup was implicated in the Napster Wars, and as I got involved with EFF, I found myself more interested in EFF than my startup, and that's that's how I ended up there. I moved to Europe <laughs> to be their European director, uh, and I represented them at the UN, and uh, particularly at the World Intellectual Property Organization, but also at UNCTAD, and also through the Access to Knowledge uh, project, which became the Marrakesh Treaty on the Rights of Blind and Visually Disabled People to Access Copyrighted Works. I represented them in Brussels and in Westminster uh, and lived in London for 13 years. Uh, I took a hiatus because um, I'm a novelist and uh, my books became bestsellers and I was making a living from it and it was hard to juggle both writing and uh, working at EFF. And so I took a hiatus and was kind of a uh, cheerleader and sometimes supporter. But after about five or, well, eight or nine years of that, I got to the point where I couldn't sit on the sidelines and watch things sort of spiral ever worse in terms of tech policy, not, not through any lack of effort from EFF, but just because there were a lot of forces arrayed against having good tech policy. And so I went back to work on a project uh, related to getting rid of digital rights management uh, and help locate two plaintiffs that we're now suing the US government on the behalf of, uh, Matthew Green, who's a, a cryptographer at Johns Hopkins, and uh, Bunny Huang, Andrew Bunny Huang, who's uh, uh, along with me. We're both MIT Media Lab affiliates. He um, has a PhD in electrical engineering from MIT, and we represented him when he broke the DRM on the Xbox. He's now a kind of legendary hardware engineer, open hardware engineer. Uh, and we are representing them 
in a lawsuit against the U.S. government to overturn Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that's very heavily implicated in repair. It's the rule that says that bypassing a copyright lock is illegal even if you don't infringe copyright. So for example, if you um, have a, a Medtronic uh, ventilator and the screen breaks and you have a screen from a dead ventilator that you can harvest and put in the, the working ventilator, you have to enter an unlock code uh, that restricts access to the firmware. And because the firmware is a copyrighted work and because Section 12.1 of the DMCA right, right makes it a crime to bypass an access control to a copyrighted work, then just telling your Medtronic ventilator to recognize the screen without paying Medtronic for an unlock code uh, is illegal, and giving someone a tool to do that is a potential felony under Section 12.1 of the DMCA, punishable by a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine. So there are lots of ways that we could fix that horrible law. We could have right. Congress fix the law, but one of the fastest ways to fix a law or, or reliable or most uh, leveraged, right? One of the ones that small scrappy organizations like EFF can use when they're facing giant inter-industry coalitions is what's called impact litigation. It's when you ask a court to nullify a law on the grounds that it's unconstitutional. And we've had some pretty significant successes with this, most notably, and around the same time as that Steve Jackson case, there was another case uh, related to cryptography and whether civilians should be allowed to access uh, strong cryptography. And right. we represented a cryptographer named Daniel Bernstein and argued that the uh, First Amendment of the Constitution guaranteed his right to publish source code. And the Ninth Circuit uh, agreed with us. The appellate division upheld it. And ever since then, civilians have had access to strong cryptography. Uh, w and another way of saying strong cryptography is working cryptography. We don't really have right, strong right. and weak cryptography. We have cryptography that we know works, and we have cryptography that you shouldn't use. Uh, there isn't really a, a weak cryptography. It's kind of a misnomer that the NSA invented to make us think that that there was such a thing as think that as as cryptography that you should use, but that is also breakable, which is not a thing right. that we should ever use. So, uh, over time, that project has expanded. It, it put me in contact with the Repair Coalition um, and the iFixit people, and I uh, worked on uh, exemptions at the US Copyright Office in the last round of hearings on the DMCA, the Copyright Office holds hearings every three years to grant exceptions. The repair exceptions are, are uh, pretty important. A lot, of those, um, a lot of those exceptions are pretty ornamental because when the Copyright Office grants an exception allowing you to uh, bypass DRM, it doesn't include an exception for tools. And so they might say, mm. if you are blind, you have the right to remove DRM from an ebook so that you can put it in a screen reader. But what they right, can't right. say, what they say they can't say by statute, I think it's a stupid argument, but what they say the statute prohibits them from doing is authorizing anyone to give you a tool to remove the DRM. And so if you're blind and you can figure out like a defect in Adobe ebook reader or the Kindle DRM, then you can write your own exploit and unwrap the DRM from your ebook and give it to a screen reader. But you can't give anyone else that tool. You can't tell anyone else how you built the tool. You can't reveal any of the inner technical workings of the tool. It's a pretty meaningless exemption. But with repair, right, there's right. actually some important exemptions, right? Like, say you have to break DRM in order to uh, uh, find out what a diagnostic code means in a car engine on a CAN bus or a wireless interface. If you break the DRM yourself, and then produce a manifest of how to interpret the codes, the manifest is lawful to traffic in. Yeah, you can't tell anyone how you got it. You can't, you can't give them a tool to make their own, but we only need that to happen once. So those repair exceptions are actually pretty important. They're not comprehensive. Like we still need uh, uh, exemptions to allow people to activate uh, parts in uh, smart devices like tractors and ventilators and phones and so on, uh, car engines too. But but um, this is on its own. That's this is a, this is still very important. So I worked on that. There's a new round of those coming up, and and that work led me into competition work more broadly and monopoly work, and uh, and into um, uh, a technical concept that's very important to repair. That we started off calling adversarial interoperability. Uh, that's a real mouthful. It doesn't abbreviate well. Uh, so now we yeah. call it we, we call it we call it competitive compatibility. Comcom is kind of fun to say, and and competitive compatibility is when you make something work with an existing product or service against the wishes of the people who made that product or service. Right, third party okay. printer ink. 
right? Like I figured out how to get ink to print in my printer. My printer, my printer's manufacturer doesn't want that ink to work, but I figured it out. So adversarial interoperability is hugely important to the history of technology. It's where it all comes from, right? The modems were adversarial interoperable. AT&T didn't want them. Um, uh, right. You know, iWork Suite, right? The reason we still have Mac OS is because when uh, Microsoft was squeezing Apple users by not making functional versions of Office for the Mac, Steve Jobs was able to hire some engineers to reverse the file formats for Word and Excel and PowerPoint and make Keynote and Numbers and, and Pages. And he didn't do that with their permission, right? He just, he just no. did it. And you know, the thing is that today, if you were to do that to Apple, right, if you made an iTunes compatible reader for uh, iTunes files, they would sue you into a radioactive crater. That uh, right, I was I was scanning your article yeah. that you posted on this, I think back in December, and one thing that I caught my eye in that was the whole notion of the people that are that did it to get to where they are now don't want it to be done to them. Yeah, everyone wants to pull up the ladder, right? I, I used to say in the in the Napster days that every pirate wants to be an admiral, right? That the right. The, the history of <laughs> entertainment technology goes like you had sheet music that was copyrightable, but performance wasn't because it wasn't in a fixed medium. And so the, the industry was, the music industry was writing songs, not performing them. That wasn't an industry, that was a craft. And then sound recordings come along and it industrializes uh, performance, right? And so the, the sheet music publishers said to the record producers, like, what are you doing, you pirates? And the record record producers were like, "Well, what do you mean? I'm I'm. What did you think I was going to do? I, I'm singing the song. You wrote the song. I'm singing the song. I'm performing the song. So then along comes radio, and radio puts the records on the air. And the record people say, "Hey, when we took the what sheet music, doing? that was progress. But when you take our records, that's piracy." And then along comes cable, and the broadcasters say, "Oh, well, we started off by taking records. That was progress. But when you take our broadcast signals." and put them over a wire, that's piracy. And then comes the VCR, and the cable operator said, well, we took the broadcast signals, that was progress. <laughs> when you take the, 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 those cable signals, that's piracy. And then Sony, the manufacturer of the VCR, who went to the Supreme Court to defend it, joins the lawsuit against Napster to say that when we stole the cable signals to put them on tape, that was progress. But when you took those, those recordings and put them on the internet, that's piracy. And, you know, every right. pirate wants to be an admiral, right? That's, that's, that's pretty self-evident to me. Uh, and, and certainly it's what's happening. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's funny how that behind every analogy you just made, there seems to be someone holding a money bag. Sure. Yeah, I mean, the golden rule, everyone has the gold, the gold makes the rule, right? It's my money, and, and, and you know, you, yeah. have to, you have to give me more money in order to get the access. I, yeah. I, not to, not to yeah. debase it or anything, but that's just every one of those yeah. levels, I can see somebody with dollar sign. It happens all the time. In 2016, I want to say, there was a Chicago restaurant called um, Aloha Poke. That was like, it was started yeah. by a couple of Midwesterners, and it made poke bowls, which is Hawaiian food. And they got a trademark on poke. And they tried to shut down Hawaiian, or on Aloha, rather. And they tried to shut down Hawaiian restaurants and restaurants owned by Pacific Islanders around America who had poke restaurants with the word Aloha in their name. And, like, their argument was, we stole it fair and square, right? Like, you don't, like we papered it over, right? Like, the fact that you never thought to register the <laughs> trademark, that's, that's your problem. Like, yeah, never mind the word Aloha dates back to when Tahiti was called right. Tahiti, and, and it's like 5,000 years old, and it's the state motto of Hawaii. It's ours now, right? It reminded me of Eddie Izzard's uh, comedy routine, but have you brought a flag? Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. terra nullius, right? The empty land, right? I, when I found it, uh, nobody was using it, and then I claimed it. And by nobody was using it, what I mean is actually everyone was using it, and everyone and no one mean the same thing. Because when everyone's using it, it's not anyone's property, right? So, like, if it's not anyone's property, then it can be my property because no one was using it. Right. <laughs> That's wild. That's wild stuff right there. Uh, it, puts, it puts me in mind of Baltimore and the word Hun and the lady who runs Hun Fest who, when she trademarked Hun, copyrighted Hun, the city just flipped their gourd. Sure. Uh, I'm from Baltimore and, and highlighted right. town. It was the same story. I was like, you can't just... You're going to copyright something that's someone's heritage and something you can do it forever just because you like it. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, it's I mean, the, I gave a talk about this, you know, in in, in um, 98, 
the the Sonny Bono Copyright Act was passed that extended copyright for 20 years and nothing entered the public domain in America for 20 years. And a few years ago, finally, we started to see the public domain again, works from 23, enter the public domain. And I gave a talk about it and I said, look, you know, this whole argument looks a lot like settler colonialism, right? The motto of settler colonialism was terra nullius, right? This is an empty land. So in, in Australia, the um, program of genocide against Aboriginal people was justified by saying they weren't people, right? The land was officially empty. So if the land is empty, the things that live there can't be people because land that has people on it is not empty. So once you declare the land empty, you can just grab what, what's there. And you can take the people who are the traditional owners of it and you can declare their claims Ill illegitimate. You can call them thieves, right? Like that's the difference between like a con artist and a grifter is that like the con artist picks your pocket but the grifter uh, gets a court to declare that the money in your pocket belongs to them. Right, right. Theft by contract. <laughs> wow. That's, that's, that's wild And, you know, stuff. this brings us back around to, to right to repair and this idea of digitally enabled goods that, um, yeah. you know, are vigilant to make sure that the people who own them don't use them in ways that displease the shareholders of the company that made them. This has never been an obligation on a customer. You know, there's this story like that HP tells about not using third party ink where they say, well, the deal was <clears throat> that when we sold it to you, you would have to use our ink and you'd have to pay more than, right. you know, vintage of click co prices for that ink. And if you didn't like it, you shouldn't have bought the printer. And there's an equally valid counter story, which is like, when I bought it, it became mine and you cease to yes. have any claim over what to do with it. And if you didn't want me to use it in ways that benefit me, you shouldn't have sold it to me. Because now right. it's Why gone. did you take my money? Right. right. And to go back to your yeah. ventilator example, I own these two things. What? It, why are you getting in between me hooking up this screen I own to this ventilator I own and making them work? I mean, there's there's an argument that a lot of them will make too that it voids warranty. And that's, you know, there's maybe something there. But if I'm not asking you to service it because I'm able to service it myself, that's an irrelevant argument. It kind of, it, you kind of don't need a warranty at that point. <laughs> right. Well, it turns out that Congress actually already investigated this question, right? They already decided that third-party repair doesn't void your warranty, right? They just they just told people, look, if you don't want if you don't want to have to fix stuff that's had third-party repair, don't sell stuff. No one put a gun to your head and said right. you have to make things in a country where third-party repair is legal. If you don't like it, you know, find a country where they're more less uh, less hostile to your preferences about repair. But you know, like you made it, you got to warranty it, you got to fix it. And, you know, the, at state levels, we've seen things, I believe it's Washington state that's passed a law that says that everything has to be repairable for seven years, where, you know, manufacturers have to make the, the parts for seven years. And so, you know, you buy a MacBook on one side of the state line, and after five years, you bring it in for Apple Care, and they say, I'm sorry, it's a write-off. But you go to the other side of the state line, they're like, okay, we'll have that fixed up for you in a day. Yeah. It's kind of bananas. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, comp so, the companies like to pretend that it's trans transcendentally hard and like they're being asked to do something unreasonable. And really, it's merely difficult and they're just being asked to do something less profitable. And you know what? Like, there's no right to be as profitable as possible and to have everyone yes. else arrange their affairs to make sure that you can earn as much profit as possible. Like, I look out for my interests, you look out for yours. That's how market economies are supposed to work. They're not supposed to be that we all... Uh, we all arrange ourselves to the benefit of someone else's shareholders. There's no, con you know, felony contempt of business model. <laughs> so <laughs> let's switch gears a little bit and, and let's let you talk about some of your upcoming books that, that you've got, right? So uh, I was particularly interested in, in Attack Surface and I know Jason was interested in Posey the Monster Slayer. So. Yeah, sure. I mean, those are those are actually both out there. They're recent books. I had four books out oh, in okay. 2020. It was a very busy year. Uh, Yikes! But uh, Posey the Monster Slayer is my. It's a it's a picture book for maker kids. It's about a little girl who uh, is obsessed with monsters, and every night she hunts monsters by tearing apart her toys and reassembling them as field expedient monster killing weapons. And her parents come in and they they order her to bed 
uh, and uh, every time they, they come in order to bed, they, they're getting more and more haggard and tired, and eventually they turn into zombies. And that's the one monster <laughs> Posey can't defeat. Uh, oh, no. But all they want to do is tuck her in. Nice. I just, I, it's, it's such a great concept um, for, you know, getting kids interested in making and, and, and thinking outside the box and their, their, their ability to, to turn one thing into another. And I, I just, I love the art. Uh, it's very pretty. And the representation of clearly um, a, 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 an interracial presenting family um, mm-hmm. I love it. It's, it's, it's inclusive of everybody and it really does capture that, I, I guess, put the mindset of you can do it, you can fix, you can make, you can do into a small person's head, um, and really jumpstart that. And, and, and I, I absolutely love it. I just, I'm sorry, I'm gushing about oh, that. thank you. It, yeah, it that, that art was all down to that. It. And I know you've written all of these awesome novels and, and, and nonfiction, but I'm the, I'm the one that wants to talk about the kids' book just because I guess the kid in me is enthralled with it. <laughs> well, Matt Rockefeller was the artist, and he did such a good job uh, uh, making those illustrations sing, and he, we found a great balance between my preference for, you know, universal classic monsters and an updated kid-friendly look. I, I love how that book came out. Um, and you know, my daughter is called Posey. And so it was quite, it was quite fun to, to have that book come out. How, how old is your daughter? Oh, she's 13 now. And while she was quite excited when it first came out, she's now very embarrassed. She's like, uh, dad. dad. (laughs) So I I was going to say, you know, you were mentioning the Steve Jackson games raid. Uh, the canonical book on that is a book by Bruce Sterling called the hacker crackdown. Uh, and that was one of the things that got me interested in, um, in getting involved with, uh, with, with, uh, uh, EFF and Bruce was the, one of the, the founders of the cyberpunk movement. And, you know, the whole idea that we call, uh, things, something punk, he was also like a a OG steampunk and so on. And Bruce is Posey's godfather. And Bruce's okay. advice to me when Posey was born is no matter like how cool and boho and outre and and you know like hip you are, by the time you are your kid is fifteen, you will epitomize contentable bourgeois normalcy for her in every way. <laughs> and my kids thirteen were ahead of schedule. We're like right there, like dud, don't make books about me. Yeah, so J- Jason Jason's kid is thir- is going to be just turned thirteen. My daughter is 12, uh, so we're on the same wavelength as you on that uh, right there. I was once the super dad, and now I'm the big embarrassing guy that they don't want, you know, in the background making noises while they're talking about to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> I love every yeah. day. Yeah. There, so, you know, thing about, you were talking about toy hacking, and one of the coolest things I ever saw was um, there was a hacker space for kids in Toronto called Maker Kids. And um, their onboarding process was they had a room full of uh, toys, various kinds of toys, some electronic, some not. And then they had a bunch of different shops, a metal shop, a wood shop, and a set of tools. Uh, and the onboarding was take apart one or more of these toys and make something out of it, and then it's yours. And, you know, if you dis- and we'll help you. If you want to figure out how to mount this to that, we'll show you how to use the drill press and put, a, like, a pin in it, and then how to use wood glue and whatever. And that was, it was like... Uh, just in time education, right? Like it, when I went to shop, they're like, here's how you use a lathe, but not what you would ever use a lathe for. They made us make candlesticks. I was like, oh, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm now an, an 11 year old with a candlestick. <laughs> well, that's great. You know, whereas with this, it's all kid driven. They're starting with the stuff that the kids uh, uh, want to do. And when the kid has a question about how to make a thing happen, they show them the tool and show them how to use it. Well, and the kids have such amazing ideas for things to do to begin with. Like, as an adult, it would be very, very difficult for me to go in there with somebody and say, okay, take these two things and make something of it and have it be anywhere near as creative as when the kids do that. Yeah. Right? right. Uh, very empowering. So that's amazing. Very yeah, empowering. Very empowering. Very good. And so they're shut down, but everyone should use that exercise. It's a great exercise for onboarding kids to a makerspace. And absolutely, and, and as a parent, I don't ever want—I I don't want to see any kid lose that. 
uh, I guess as we get older, you know, we get, I, I don't want to say jaded, but we, we tend to push that imagination and push that ability to come up with stuff like that to the back. And, and I, I try to encourage that. And I love seeing that. Uh, other people encourage that and, and, and get the kids, you know, stay a kid. You know, you can be an adult, but remember, stay a kid and stay a still kid. have that imagination. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. I like to say you the know? idea is to die young as late as possible. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> a, it's a hard, it's a hard road to hoe. You know, it's, it's tough to be a kid, especially in these times. Um, and you know, one of the things that get to getting this back onto the question of repair, you know, this is a moment in which the digital divide has never been more important and in which interoperability has never been more important. And so we have these tools like zoom and Google classroom and, and then their evil cousins like um, Proctorio, which does remote invigilation that uh, tries to catch cheaters. And so it's doing things like trying to do sentiment analysis by looking at your face and figuring out if you're looking off into space and maybe staring at a, a cheat sheet that you've hung up behind your monitor. It's really terrible stuff. And it's this moment <laughs> in which like figuring out how to rehabilitate uh, old devices and get them on the network, figuring out how to... Um, you know, uh, uh, bodge uh, uh, like a Wi-Fi repeater out of a phone or, you know, make a hotspot when, when your wireline network goes down. This is, it's never been more important. It's never been more salient. I mean, I, um, 11 years ago, Finland declared that uh, broadband was a human right and people laughed at them. And they said, you know, like this is, um, you know, this is a, a, a you're 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 so self-important you weird nerds you think that the place where you argue about star trek is a human right and you know what we said then and what is true now is that like while most things that we do today involve the internet everything that we do tomorrow is going to require it and and we hit yeah. that moment overnight with the pandemic and the idea Absolutely. that you cannot make devices Absolutely. that work the way you need them to work in these conditions when when you have like the one wire that delivers free speech and a free press and free association and access to politics and civics and education and uh, romance and family life and medicine and that you can't reconfigure it to to suit you know your individual unique distinctive requirements that is um, a really important deficit in our policy and when we talk about repair a lot of the times we're talking about fixing things, but repair is really a subset of adaptation. Like a lot of the things what's broken about your device is that, for example, it requires the cloud to work and the cloud's not reliable. So you bodge it so that it doesn't check the cloud, right? Um, you know, you stick, you stick the driver in a VM where it just pings a system uh, that it sh thinks should be alive and the VM just answers all pings with uh, like an ACK and says, yeah, you're on the internet. And then the device just rolls on and, and does what it needs to do. That's that that's something that is um, absolutely critical. And it's something that came up a lot when I was working on access to knowledge and the Marrakesh Treaty and accessibility rights more broadly, is that, uh, you know, all of us are only temporarily able-bodied. My friend Liz Henry, who um, worked for Mozilla for a long time and is uh, an accessibility person, uh, she made that point to me very forcefully, right? It, it, the only way you will die without being disabled is if you die young. Um, because if we, if you live long enough, you will have some form of disability. And there is no, there is no like Politburo at an electronics company or a software shop where they can like sketch out every single way that you will need to adapt things to suit your individual circumstances. Right. And, uh, unless you have the freedom to do that there will then then the disability that you face the circumstance that you face will always be compounded by the indifferent cruelty of someone who decided that you couldn't be trusted to know what you needed and, and to go to take that a, a, another step you know recently uh there was a petition circulated that i signed about the the cry cut you know, the paper cutting, leather cutting robot machines, yeah. right? Where people wanted to, to uh, they're, they're now rolling out a fee to use their cloud service. And so if you want to upload your design to the machine that you bought, you have to pay a monthly fee in order to keep using that machine that wasn't there before when you bought the machine. 
And so the petition is, you know, hey, hey, you can't do this, right? You offered this up as a free service before. You can't suddenly now charge me for it unless there, you know, there needs to be a suitable workaround for how I can get my files onto this box. And, it, you know, so it just, it, it all just snowballs and, and take, you know, the, the disability side of that that you mentioned is something that I personally hadn't thought of before, but you're absolutely correct about that. And, you know, with, with, with Circuit, it's even worse because, you know, they were in a field where there was a relatively robust competition and they bought most of their competitors and those mergers were waved through with little scrutiny. Right? We, we have for 40 years pursued a bipartisan doctrine that says that mergers are just basically fine. They're not anti-competitive. Even if they seem anti-competitive, they should be tolerated. And, and then there were free and open source drivers for for circuit that actually worked with, across multiple machines and they used uh, copyright threats to shut down those free and open source drivers and so right. you have an, an an uncompetitive market where your choices about what you can buy are extremely limited and then you have an aftermarket that has been hobbled by um, anti-competitive action right where the the, the, the the dominant firm has not only designed their device, so that it, it is maximally extractive of its owner, but they've also uh, abused copyright law to prevent competitors from unlocking that potential, from, from you know, making the third-party printer ink effectively for, for this device. That type of behavior is, it's not just technology, it's, it's, it's everywhere. You see it in agriculture with, with Monsanto or whoever, or whatever they call themselves now. And and yeah. other places where they, they they buy all the they buy all the competition, and then they put out theirs, and they're you don't have an option anymore because they start. I, I don't want to say loopholing, but they start uh, using the legal system that we have in place and and the laws to benefit them, and the little guy, the little farmer, the little the little tech you know the little tech store can't find it because they so don't have the money. Yeah. So it, it's, it's yeah. There's the there's this halfway clever there's this halfway clever thing people say where they say if you're not paying for the product you're the product but the reality is that you know no one gives farmers free tractors right and and no one gives uh, um, uh, you a free iPhone in exchange for promising that you'll only get it fixed at a genius bar the reality is that you are treated as a product if the company can get away with treating you as a product right if they don't have right. to fear competition and they don't have to fear legal reprisal mm -hmm. or liability. And so with tractors and Monsanto, it's very interesting because you have John Deere tractors who are, um, uh, it's a duopoly with tractors, Deere uh, uh, has. And Deere, you know, historically had this very symbiotic relationship with farmers. Um, there's a, there was a very moving article published by an engineer whose grandfather was one of the original Deere engineers. And his job was to go to farms and see how farmers had adapted their, their tractors and other industrial equipment, their agricultural equipment, and then go back and turn those into products, right? To take the ingenuity that occurred on the farmstead and turn it into products that all farmers could enjoy. And Deere has shut down the right to repair. If you put a new part in your tractor, which farmers do on the reg, right? They, they, take a, they, they get the part that they need to fix their tractor. They put it in the tractor. You still have to type an unlock, an unlock code into the tractor to get it to recognize the part. And only the technician can do that. You have to wait x days for the technician to come out and there's you know this old saying you make hay while the sun shines right you don't have x days the hailstorm is coming you need to get right, the crop right. in and that is bad enough but the the way that deer tractors are designed you know in order to change the firmware in order to reconfigure your tractor you have to unlock the bootloader you have to bypass the the access control Bypassing an access control is illegal. Making a tool to bypass an access control is a felony. And so um, what that means is that anything that happens on the other side of that bootloader cannot be undone by the farmer. Now, deer tractors have got torque sensors in the wheels. They've got undercarriage humidity sensors. And they've got centimeter accurate location sensors that use a combination of GPS and other location to give them highly accurate location sensing. And when you drive your own tractor around your field, your tractor is recording the soil density and humidity at every spot in your field with a high degree of accuracy for precision agriculture applications. But you can't access that data. That data is exfiltrated wirelessly from your tractor back to Deere. 
Deer then takes that data and aggregates it with other data to sell into the futures market so they can make bets on, on agricultural futures. And then they also sell it to crop monopolists. They sell it to Monsanto, which is now called Bayer. And you, when you buy your Bayer seed, you get Bayer app and Bayer data for your, for your farm. And your, your tractor can do precision agriculture with your seed. But it's your data. Right, like you generated that data by that's, driving your six hundred thousand dollar tractor around your field. Right, that's bananas. Right, that's, it, it, that's it's crazy. It's a remarkable situation. That's, that's yeah, crazy. yeah. And you know, in the free culture movement, yeah. there's the, there's a lot of resistance to the term intellectual property. They they don't like this term. Right, they say that well, first of all, it's not really property, and second of all, it's so imprecise. Trademark isn't copyright. Copyright isn't patent. None of them are trade secrets. Blah 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 blah. And, and they, they, they make this argument that we should just use the terms, right? If you mean trademark, say trademark. If you mean copyright, say copyright. But I have come to think in the last year that there actually is a very precise meaning to intellectual property when used by the industry. When the industry says we have IP, what they mean is that they have located a way to use the law to control their competitors, their critics, and their customers, right? To reach out beyond the sale and to exercise control over third parties. So like, I can stop you from making an interoperable product. I can stop you from using an interoperable product if you bought my product. And if you're a security researcher who has to bypass an access control in order to validate whether or not this device is fit for human use, whether this, you know, um, well, Medtronic, we talked about before, they make the ventilators. They also make insulin pumps, continuous glucose monitors, implanted defibrillators and implanted um, uh, pacemakers. And they're wildly insecure devices. Uh, they're vulnerable to supply chain attacks, right? They, they, you can, um, they, don't, they don't use, they didn't for many years use code signing on firmware updates. So mm -hmm. you could send bad firmware to someone's heart, right? That's not good. Um, and then good. They, they also didn't validate, like the wireless interface like didn't do, yeah, the wireless interface didn't do auth. So you could, because like, of course, medical implants have to have wireless interfaces, right? Like, you know, attaching a USB cable to something in your chest cavity is hard, right? So uh, they have wireless interfaces, but they didn't, they didn't authenticate them or secure them. So you could stand 10 feet away and stop someone's heart, right? Like these are terrible devices. And to do yeah. this research, independent security researchers needed to bypass access controls. And in doing right. so, they face potential liability. And at EFF, we hear from security researchers who say, there's a thing I want to look up, but I can't because I don't want to get sued or I don't want to face criminal sanction. Right. Or I found right. a thing, but I can't publish on it. And, you know, the, the, the horrible fallacy that these companies operate under is that um, if, if they do this, that the bad news won't get out. What actually happens is if they do this, people just put the bad news on pastebin. Right? Like no one goes to them and says, hey, I found some bad stuff. I'll give you six months to fix it. And then I'm going public. It's just like, surprise, your zero day is on the Internet. Right. Like the managed process is not a process where you get a veto. The managed process is the process in which the veto belongs to the person who knows a true fact about a defect in your product. And the only way you can get them to uh, withhold from from announcing that preemptively is by being such a good actor that you convince them that if they tell you first that you will then patch it rather than poo-pooing it or downplaying it or, or ignoring it or burying it until after the next quarterly report so that your share price doesn't tank before bonus season. And only then will people come into the managed system. The idea that you can have a managed system by threatening to jail people who inform your customers that your products are not safe, that is not a, a good alternative. I was just going to say that as a software engineer, like all of that, that unsecure wireless, all of that uns unsigned updates, that's just, it's terrifying. Uh, when I was in college, uh, we took a, uh, um, yeah. what was it, um, an ethics course, uh, uh, and it was called Professionalism in Computing. And there was a book that we read called Set Phasers on Stun. And if you want to see the effects of complex systems that were not properly tested, uh, software or otherwise, uh, that is an excellent book to read, although it will probably scare you a little bit. Yeah. Well, why don't we wrap that up by, by saying, you know, software is part of right to repair, right? Being able to um, install third party firmware and devices, you know, particularly an area where this has been very common is in routers. Um, the routers, you know, are dumpster fires. 
They're generally supplied by cable monopolists or, or, or uh, DSL monopolists in insecure states. And um, people have for a long time been wiping out the firmware on their routers and installing an open firmware called DDWRT. And DDWRT comes about just as an accident. Uh, Linksys, before it was part of Cisco, did not uh, honor the open source license, the free software license, the GPL, that came with the version of GNU Linux that they were using in their routers. And so they were sued. And part of the uh, settlement was to release source code and do a bunch of other stuff that enabled the, the creation of DDWRT. And, and so, you know, if you want to fix your router so that it's not exposing you and the devices on your network, which may include things like cameras in your children's bedroom, although, God, don't put cameras in your children's bedroom. But, but people put cameras in their children's bedroom. And if you want that to be secured at the perimeter of your LAN and you don't want it to be leaking out to randos who are driving by, um, you might want to change the software. And we talk about replacing firmware as though it's like sorcery. And... It's not. I mean, people make alternative firmware for all kinds of devices. Corey, I want to I want to talk about your your, your newest book releases. Uh, I, we have to attack the surface, which was in October, and how to destroy surveillance capitalism, which was in January. And that that title caught my eye. Um, I have not I'm not familiar with how to destroy, but it is now on my uh, after oh, very reading, good. doing the research. It's research. It's now on my reading list. So oh, very good. Um, Tell us a little bit about, about these titles. Yeah, sure. Well, Attack Surface is uh, uh, it's the third Little Brother book. I wrote these two young adult novels about hacker kids resisting sort of technological oppression. Um, they were very successful and adapted for stage and optioned for film and translated into lots of languages. And if you watch the Ed Snowden documentary, uh, Citizen Four, when he packs up all the things he's going to need when he's fleeing Hong Kong and going into exile, he grabs the sequel to Little Brother, grabs Homeland, puts it in his go bag. It was pretty good. That's wild. <laughs> that kind of shout out. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty great. He actually wrote the introduction to the reissue of Little Brother and Homeland that came out this summer. And so, you know, over the years, I'd heard from a lot of security professionals who said that their entree into the field was by reading Little Brother and Homeland, not just security professionals, human rights workers, cyber lawyers, people who, who got involved in the policy side of tech, as well as the techie side of tech. And I wanted to write a book for adults. And so Attack Surface is a standalone novel for adults. And it's about a young woman who works for surveillance contractors. She starts off working for the DHS and then for uh, 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 Beltway bandits who supply surveillance to uh, forward operations bases in Iraq. And then finally, she goes full private sector. And she's just a gun for hire selling surveillance to the worst dictators in the world. And she has a, a crisis of conscience, and it's about her crisis of conscience that sends her back to Oakland, where she grew up, and where she finds that her best friend, who's now a leader in a, a, a Black Lives Matter style movement, is being targeted by the same cyber weapons that she spent her career building and perfecting. And she has to confront what it means to have been complicit in building those tools and in unleashing them in the world. The book's had a very good reception. It's been very unfortunately timely. Uh, and like the Little Brother books, it's a book that uses science fiction to explain extremely complex technical uh, uh, concepts through narrative. Uh, you know, the first couple of books uh, explain things like um, uh, uh, dual key cryptography and key signing parties and uh, uh, secure hashing and so on. And this one explains things like adversarial examples, machine learning, um, uh, you know, how zero days work in the marketplace for zero days, um, uh, how stingrays and cell site simulators work, how side, uh, sideband attacks and um, attacks on baseband radios work, uh, and that sort of thing. And, and also how organizational tactics work uh, within that context. And then How to Destroy Surveillance Capitalism, it's a pamphlet, really. It's a short book, long essay. Uh, that attempts to refute some of uh, Shoshana Zuboff's idea of surveillance capitalism. So Zuboff uh, is quite alarmed by the things that big tech says they can do. You know, big tech claims to their own customers, to advertisers, that when they gather enough data on us, they can sell us anything. And that's a thing that advertisers have been telling their customers for a very long time. Everyone who's ever claimed to have a mind control ray was lying to themselves or to everyone else, or both. 
And <laughs> the evidence that that big tech has perfected a mind control ray to sell your nephew fidget spinners and that, you know, Robert Mercer stole it and made your uncle a, a QAnon racist who voted for Trump is pretty thin. Right. It, it, it may just be that your uncle was a racist all along uh, and that what big tech has done is made it easy for people who have disfavored views to find each other, which is not an entirely bad thing. There are lots of views that were historically disfavored that I'm glad people who believe in them can find each other. Um, people who want to unionize their Amazon warehouse or people who don't think uh, gender is a binary and want to find out what it means to explain the, you know, the words for the thing that they feel inside their heart or people who think Black Lives Matter. You know, th those ideas are only spreading now because people who think them can find each other without having to risk the social sanction that comes from announcing it to the world before you're ready to, yes. um, you know, to, to talk about it with the people you feel comfortable with. And so it instead, you know, my book looks at the role that monopoly plays in determining our outcomes that, you know, if Facebook is nudging us to do things with, with manipulation, even if you think they're doing it, even the most wild claims that Facebook makes, are things like, well, we did this non-consensual psychological experiment on 60 million people to see if we could get them to vote, and 0.4% of them did, more than we thought would. You know, we, we saw a rise of 0.4% over the expected voter turnout. Well, the, you know, Facebook shouldn't be performing non-consensual psychological experiments on 60 million people, <laughs> right? But a 0.4% effect size is pretty small. Whereas, if you buy an iPhone, there's a damn close to 100% chance that you're going to get your apps from Apple. Right. That is a right. very, very, very large degree of behavior control that has nothing to do with bypassing your critical faculties and everything to do with a monopoly, a monopoly backstop by law and a law that is paid for with the rents that come from the monopoly. Right. And so I think that if you are worried about being manipulated by tech, I think you should be worried about being manipulated by tech, then you should be worried about monopolies because you know, maybe you go to Facebook because they figured out how to like show you, um, you know, content that that gets your blood boiling and gets you into arguments. That might be one reason you go. But the main reason you go to Facebook is all your friends are held hostage there. And the only way to talk to them yep. is by using Facebook. It's not like email. It's not interoperable. You can't send your friends Facebook messages from Twitter, right, or from right. Mastodon or from uh, diaspora, you can only send it from Facebook because Facebook sues anyone who tries to plug their service into Facebook. And so, you know, Facebook having uh, tricked us all into taking each other hostage is is a lot more significant than any manipulation Facebook does. And, you know, if you walk away from uh, a, a question that you had that you didn't know the answer to with the wrong answer, it's because there's only one place we all search, and it's Google. And Google got its monopoly by buying other companies, not by making things people love. Google has made one and a half successful products in its entire corporate history. It made a really good search engine, a pretty good Hotmail clone, and everything else that it made that succeeded, it bought from someone else, and everything that it made in-house in crashed and burned. And so, you know, if, if Google had been... Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? So, you know, the difference between Edison and the... the, the the post-war, post-New Deal era, is that it, it became illegal for companies to buy their competitors, right? We started in, in, enforcing antitrust law. If, if Google had been around under the regime that predated Ronald Reagan, they wouldn't have been allowed to buy Android. They wouldn't have been allowed to buy their ad tech stack. Their entire ad tech stack is exogenous, right? They wouldn't have been able to buy uh, maps. They wouldn't have been able to uh, do YouTube. Right. Like they would be a search engine. And if they had ads alongside the, the search, they'd be using a third party standalone ad broker. And that third party standalone ad broker would not have Google Analytics to use to feed its ad engine. Right. And we would we would not have a web that was five giant websites filled with text, of, uh, you know, screenshots of text from the other four. Right. We would have a diverse pluralistic web that wasn't under the control of five companies. You know, people look at that picture of the tech leaders hanging around with Donald Trump at the top of Trump Tower after the 2016 election. They're like, how can Tim Cook and, you know, Jeff Bezos all meet with Donald Trump? It's like, yeah, sure. But how is it that everyone who runs tech fits around one table? Like, right. I don't really care who they're meeting with if they all fit around one table. That's a problem to begin with. So I think uh, we've got ta maybe time for one more question. And the, 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 sure. the doozy I thought of, the doozy I thought of, 
I mean, I'll, I could talk all night. But, you know, I want to respect your time. I, I know we had you for about an hour. Um, so the doozy I had was, how much of a cyberpunk dystopia are we already living in? And what do you see as the steps to getting into a more solar punk future? What are the key things that ah. you would like to do to get us there? And do you have any advice for our solar punk community in general that you would like to, to share that you haven't already covered? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the joke among cyberpunk writers is um, it was always a, a, a warning and never a suggestion, you know? Right. <laughs> 1984 is not a manual for statecraft. Uh, and um, I think that uh, the thing that cyberpunk describes, right? Cyberpunk is not like a very technically rigorous literature, especially the stuff in the 80s. Um, with the exception of Rudy Rucker, none of them were technologists, uh, and they used computers in a very metaphorical way. You know, Bill Gibson says that he wrote Neuromancer after seeing kids in arcades sort of playing these stand-up games and thrusting their chests towards the game like they wanted to get inside it. And he thought cyberspace was the thing that was on the other side of that screen. It was the place that gamers were trying to get to as they were like hammering away at the two buttons and wiggling the joystick and thrusting their chest towards the cabinet. But um, what Cyberpunk did reflect was a deep anxiety about growing corporate rule, about the, the role uh, of ever in expanding corporate power was playing in the way that it, it intruded upon our lives. And, you know, it coincided with a moment in which we stopped engaging with companies as citizens and we started engaging with them as, as, as consumers, right? The, the consumerist movement, which, which has some really excellent achievements to its credit, it, it posits that the way to get companies to behave better is not to get a regulation passed that makes the company clean up its act. It's to boycott its products, right? It's to make a noise. That only works under conditions of competition, right? If the company doesn't have to worry about losing you, then it, it can afford to ignore you, or, or even worse, to just have another division do the make the product the way you want it and go on making the other product that, that you're angry about. You know, if you walk down the grocery aisle, was two companies that account for almost everything in it, Procter and Gamble and um, Unilever. And if you look at the like cruelty free food and the cruelty extra food, they're both made by the same company. <laughs> and if you look at the right. like low packaging food and the, you know, we, we padded this with like spotted owl egg packing foam, <laughs> they're made by the same company, right? That, and, and when, when Procter & Gamble buys some beloved, you know, regional brand that makes organic baby food, you know what they say? We bought it because our customers value choice, right? <laughs> you, can, you can choose anything you want so long as it came from one of two companies. Any so, color you want, as long as it's black. <laughs> as long as it's black. So consumerism falls apart without competition. <clears throat> and unless we see ourselves as more than consumers, unless we see ourselves as citizens, we are in really big trouble because the way that we enforce antitrust law, the way that we've enforced antitrust law for the last 40 years is that raising prices by uh, companies that collude to raise prices commit a crime, right? Uh, it's the one thing where you don't need a, like an economic model to prove that they did it. If like Back in, in uh, you know, the late 90s, the, the CEOs of the major record labels, like, sent each other memos detailing how they were going to fix prices on CDs, right? And, and right. like, when it's in writing, you don't, need, you don't need an economic model. Like, they just admitted they did it. They were rigging prices, right? When the p big six publishers uh, got together to force Amazon to raise the price of ebooks to 10 bucks, they, they put it in writing. Like, we don't need an economic model. So that kind of behavior is illegal. But it raises this question, why did they get together to do that? Why do they care what the retail sector is doing? Surely the retail sector would just find the best price. And the reason is that the labels were angry about the big box stores. They're angry about Walmart, which had become a a absolutely structurally uh, significant to their future and was lowering prices and squeezing them for better margins and was putting everyone else out of business because no one could compete with Walmart because they would sell products at a loss. And Walmart was not breaking the law because they didn't have to collude with anyone else to lower prices because they had a monopoly. Right. 
Right. right. So what happened to the labels? Well, there's three of them now. And when, th- when, when the CEOs of six companies get together to fix prices, that's illegal. But when they become three companies and three of those companies are under one umbrella and now they're not the CEOs of three separate companies, they're the presidents of three divisions of Universal and they have a meeting to fix prices, that's not a, a, it's not a, a illegal anymore. collusion, <laughs> right? That's, that's just doing your thing. So what happens is that monopolies create monopolies. The big six publishers are now the big four publishers, Random House, Bot, Simon & Schuster, and um, uh, um, Penguin. And, uh, and uh, over and over again, we see this pattern repeated. In, in his book, uh, Monopolize, David Dayan explains how um, the, uh, the big pharma monopolies that formed uh, early on after deregulation began to price gouge the hospitals. And hospitals can't say to the pharmaceutical company, fine, if you're going to charge that much for your cancer drug, we're not going to buy it anymore. They just have to pay for it. So the hospitals formed monopolies, right? They, they merged with each other. And then they said, oh, we're not going to, we're not going to um, pay what you're asking, Big Pharma, because Big Pharma can't afford to not have their cancer drugs in any of the hospitals in a city. But we will pay a little extra and we'll pass it on to the insurer. And we'll also pad the price for all of our other services because insurance was a, a widely dispersed, non-monopolistic industry. So the insurers monopolized. Uh, and so now you have a monopolized pharma sector, you have monopolized hospitals, and you have monopolized insurers. So there's only one group of people who aren't organized in this group, in this thing. Actually, there's two groups of people. One is healthcare workers, and right. the other one is patients. Is, is the sick people. And so you yeah. hear about healthcare workers. Yeah. You hear about healthcare workers who got laid off or denied PPE or weren't given hazard pay or were asked to, to work in, in absolutely um, unsafe conditions during the pandemic while the executive teams at their hospitals were paying themselves tens of millions of dollars in bonuses. Normally, the way that workers push back against uh, uh, employer power is by organizing unions. But one of the things that's happened along with monopolization is dismantling trade unions. And so it's very hard for them to do that. And we, the patients, well, we pay higher premiums, we get a lower standard of care, and we pay more deductibles. And um, we don't have a choice because there's only one insurer and there's only one hospital and there's only one pharmaceutical company. And so we are bound to to these systems. And the way that consumers, patients, people, historically organized against concentrated power was through the concentrated power of a democracy, right? Their elected representatives standing up for them. So that's what I mean when I say we can't see ourselves as consumers. If you see yourself as an ambulatory wallet whose only way of making change in the world is either opening or staying closed, you'll get nowhere. But if you see yourself as a member of a polity, if you see yourself as someone whom politicians owe a duty of care to, and if you insist on them being structurally dependent on you through campaign finance reform and other uh, elements that will ma- that make um, uh, democratic accountability the watchword of politicians who want to keep their jobs, that's how we create a solar punk future, right? That's how we create a future in which we we honor human thriving for the, for the greatest number of people as our greatest priority. Instead of figuring out how to funnel ever larger slices of money into ever smaller groups of executives and shareholders. And anything short of that might make a difference in the short run. It might help you out of a sticky situation, writing some code or doing something else, you know, might, might help you out, might fix something that's broken. But it's not going to make the structural shift. This, if you find yourself having written some code or convinced a person or started a business, or find the ear of a lawmaker to get a regulation changed in a way that advances yourself towards the future that you want, understand that this is just a leverage in service to the wider project of freeing yourself from only being able to act as a consumer, and instead making democratic rule the basis on which our society is run. 100%. Hundred uh, percent, and, and I'll just throw on there as well that healthcare is 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 a completely inelastic demand uh, market, right? People don't get less sick because it becomes more expensive. Yeah. 
if you're sick, you're sick. If you need insulin, yeah. you need insulin. Although they do right? ration their insulin and get more sick. They, yeah. Yes, that that is a thing yeah. that happens, and and yes. people do ration uh, mental health care visits. Care. They don't go to the dentist; yeah. they go to the ER, right? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. yeah. I mean. There's at least a couple of pharaohs who died of dental abscesses. Like, not getting dental care is a big deal. So, so we as a people, you know, it sounds like we need to stop that first domino from falling. Because that first domino that falls leads to the monopolies. And then everybody clamors for themselves. And we, the, the, the people, you know, the, the society are the ones that end up taking the brunt of it, I guess, you know, to, to dumb it down, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, uh, Corey. It's, it, I, this was very enjoyable. Uh, if you ever want to come back on the show, we'd certainly love to have pleasure. you again. This was, this was great. I, I forgot one thing. Oh. Oh, yeah, for Close sure. Yours. I realized I, I realized I forgot one important thing, which is that um, the, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has a network of affiliated standalone autonomous groups called the Electronic Frontiers Alliance. They're all over America and they stand alone and they work on local issues with EFF support and with each other's support. They network together. So EFF Austin is one of these groups. They were formed uh, specifically to work on Steve Jackson's project after he got raided and they're still around, uh, still working, still doing good work in the state house in Texas. And there are organizations like this up and down the country. And if you just type in uh, Electronic Frontiers Alliance to your favorite search engine, you can find a local group to join. Awesome. Absolutely. And we will promote that pretty heavily here uh, in relation to this interview and our, our continued coverage of, of Right to Repair and, uh, and everything associated with it. Well, we like to end every episode with, uh, with our catchphrase, which is uh, that we ask people to always to to do good and be good. That's great. Always keep a trash bag in your car. <laughs> no, I, I just, just, just giving you my Steve, the, the Steve Martin aphorism. <laughs> Always keep a trash bag in your car. There you have it. That was a lot of fun. I, I mean... really enjoyed this video. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with it. If you're all the way here to the end with us, we hope to do more interviews like this and, and we promise and we'll do better with the it. audio in the uh, future. It was so good to meet you and, and sit down and talk. Um, right to repair is huge, and I think this is a this was a big win for us to actually cap off our well, not even cap off, but just to to further our right to repair series. I learned a lot. I, it was a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to doing more stuff like this. So, thank you all for watching, and as always, do good and be good. Thanks for watching.